Hello, welcome again to our webinar by SSPD. I am Dr. Mohammed Abdelatif Al-Batal, uh, one of uh, board member of SSPD. I am uh, consultant with data industry and associate professor uh, at Al-Azhar University, Cairo, Egypt, and at Prince Saltam, Saudi Arabia. Uh, its activity uh, today is collaboration with uh, South Asia for Association for Pediatric Dentistry uh, and for, uh, collaboration also with Kunuz Ritaj Company. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this session with dear colleague Dr. Faisal Bin Aboud. Uh, Dr. Faisal is uh, holding master's degree in dental science and clinical certificate in pediatric dentistry. Uh, South Board Certificate of Pediatric Dentistry. Saudi Board is Head of uh, Pediatric Dentistry Department in Asir Department. Today we'll have two distinguished speakers. Uh, I would like to welcome the first speaker, Dr. Ankita Shah. Uh, she will talk uh, about a very interesting point. Uh, is pediatric sleep disorder, breathing and tongue tie and oral myofunction syrup. A hidden epidemic. Dr. Ankita finished uh, his uh, MDS pediatric and preventive dentistry from YMT Dental College, Mumbai, 2013. Uh, director and founder of uh, Dentition Center is a fellowship in MFS orthodontic from Spain, uh, 2017. Certified by my function orthodontic, present by the my function research. Uh, Australia, certified by Gold Learning Tongue Tie Symposium, certified also by Global Laser Oral Health, uh, first and only uh, Indian investor of uh, Peace Institute, Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Ankita, and welcome to sharing your uh, screen. Welcome, Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll share my screen. Visible? Yes. Masal Kher, everyone. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. And I'm very excited to be introducing you all to sleep in pediatrics. It's my passion to make these kids breathe and sleep better and grow healthier and happier. Uh, so today we are going to talk about pediatric sleep disorder, breathing, a bit of tongue ties and oral myofunctional therapy and how we as pediatric dentists play a very important role here. So here's a little about me. Uh, I'm Dr. Ankita Shah and I'm a pediatric and preventive dentist. I'm the founder of Dentition and uh, I always had this passion for preventive dentistry. When I actually first learned that crooked teeth were happening because of some form of muscle dysfunctions. I was uh, quite intrigued by it that, you know, correcting muscle dysfunction can correct crooked teeth. So I went on to learn and learn about it. And what I realized is that it's not just crooked teeth, but also breathing, sleeping, tongue ties, breastfeeding, these all were interrelated. And I went on to learn further at the Breathe Institute, Los Angeles. And I realized that early or preventive care or care by a pediatric dentist is going to be very important here and how a multidisciplinary approach to sleep and breathing problems can be very important. Here's a little about my practice. So when we talk about sleep and breathing, I want you to understand that there are multiple causes behind sleep and breathing. And I always suggest that the main aim should be to identify these causes, be it from different viewpoints, different experience, or even different expertise. Now, when we look at sleep and breathing problems, there should always be a multidisciplinary approach because we have a common problem, but there are many perspectives to this common problem. And I always suggest that we should have an open vision. You view the problem from either angle, but in the end, we want to resolve the problem. So what is oral and facial development? Can you all answer me in the comments? Is it genetics play an important role or it, does the environment play an important role for oral and facial development? Like, can you all just answer me in comments?
Doctor, what does everyone feel? Is it genetic? Maybe, maybe it's genetic, yes. 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 Yeah. Is, is, I think you will need to share it again. Does genetics play an important role or an environment on the oral facial development? I think it's genetic. Genetics? Yeah. OK. So let me burst a little bubble here. Uh, genetics just loads the gun, but environment is the one that is actually pulling the trigger. Now, we've known about this since, I think, uh, the time of Melvin Moss. And if you recollect that he had this uh, theory of the functional matrix, and we've never given this importance to the epigenetic factors. And uh, right from the time Melvin Moss stated in his theory that there are no genes for development of bone. In fact, the blueprint for this bone development and growth is lying in the functional matrices around it, which involves your muscles like the lips, tongue, bow, the cheeks, your tonsils, adenoids, mucosae, connective tissues, fascias. Everything around it is one which is going to stimulate the growth of uh, the bone. Even Graeber in 1982 implicated that muscles play a very important role in the development of poor facial development as well as malocclusions. Now, when we look at research, what is soft tissue dysfunction? Let's understand what is the soft tissue dysfunction. It is just an alteration of the muscular activity. So any kind of muscular activity which is altered around the face is called as a soft tissue dysfunction. And what Dr. Ramirez stated that, that any kind of these alterations, we as dentists play a very important role to identify. How are we going to identify these soft tissue dysfunctions and what kind of malocclusions are these soft tissue dysfunctions causing? So what he also stated that is when we actually devise a treatment plan, we must look at eliminating these soft tissue dysfunctions. So we must look at a choice of appliances which are going to balance the forces from the lips and the cheeks as well as from the tongue and at the same time even align teeth. So what do we think the best choice of appliances here could be? Functional orthopedic appliances. So they are going to balance the forces, correct the soft tissue dysfunction. They will help in aligning the teeth also. And at the same time, we are going to get much more stable results here. So what does our evolutionary process show? Like if we see our ancestors over here, we had nice forward growing jaws and we had a nice wide U-shaped arch as well. But when we look at the modern man, the maxilla is much recessed and we have downward and backward growing jaws. Imagine an airway right behind here. If our jaws are going backward, what is happening to our airways? Even the jaws are becoming narrower and deeper. So again, the nasal cavity space, which is right above our palate, is getting narrower. And what research is telling us that this resorption of the maxilla is seen right from the age of five years. Now, through the evolutionary process, we've also seen that there has been an increased tendency towards crooked teeth, impacted third molars. Is it that the teeth are becoming big in size? Not really. In fact, the teeth are just the same size, but our jaws are really becoming smaller in size. As we saw earlier, they are growing downward and backward. Even our muscles of mastication, if we observe here, are becoming narrower. And why is this happening? What is going wrong? So there is a change in the diet. There is most oftenly what we've seen that there is soft and mashed diet that is being used. Now, when there is soft and mashed diet, we are not making much use of our muscles of mastication. Then there's also a change in the farming methods. Now, when there is more use of fertilizers and pesticides, what is going to happen is our gut immunity is going to get affected. We are going to have inflammations, which is in turn going to affect our mouth breathing and breathing because it's going to disbalance our oxygen and carbon dioxide in the body. 
Now, bottle feeding and pacifier use has also increased. Now, this is also affecting the growth of the jaws and it is also making the jaws narrow, also making them grow backwards and affecting the airways as well. Increased screen time. Now, this is something which is very interesting and I find that which has dramatically increased in the current generation. They sit in front of the iPads or iPhones and TVs and they're generally sitting like this. Their lips are generally parted and from here they start habitual mouth breathing. Mouth breathing per se is also caused by multiple other reasons. Oral restrictions, skeletal and soft tissue dysfunction, which we are going to discuss in the slides to come. Now, before we move ahead, I want you to understand what is pediatric sleep disordered breathing. Now, I want you to know that it's a spectrum and it's a syndrome. So it usually starts as mouth breathing or noisy breathing, eventually progresses to UARS and then progresses to obstructive sleep apnea. Now, mouth breathing and noisy breathing is the first sign that there is actually something wrong. So this child may be presenting with a dry mouth, poor oral hygiene, increased cavities, there may be habitual mouth breathing, there may be a frequent cold cough, this child may be falling sick quite often, tonsils, adenoids, uh, there may be lip ties, tongue ties, even craniofacial growth could be affected. Now, when it is UARS, I want you to understand like unlike obstructive sleep apnea, there is no oxygen desaturation over here, but there is an arousal which happens because of the obstruction to the airflow. Now, when there are repeated arousals in the night, we are not getting that deep sleep that we need to get. So because of which these children will have difficulty with hyperactivity, attention issues, they'll mimic ADHD like symptoms. The tonsils may be largish, but not so large. Mildly, they may have a high arch palate, but there'll always be a soft tissue dysfunction as well. When it comes to obstructive sleep apnea, they are, there is actually an oxygen desaturation that is happening. So this is the time when most of the mainstream medical professionals will actually start treating it. And this child will represent with bed wetting. They may have anxiety issues. They may have behavior issues. Uh, they may have poor school performance. They may have high or very big tonsils in size. They may have restrictive frenulums reduced uh, uh, oral volumes because of the high arch palates and backward growing jaws. Now what I'm trying to say here is that, that this is a syndrome and not all children are going to present as one, two, three with every sign and symptom present. But you need to look at the overall picture and diagnose these cases. And why can't we really start in or jump in at mouth breathing rather than waiting till obstructive sleep apnea? Now, this slide has been adapted from Dr. Suruj Zaghi. Uh, I had the opportunity to undergo mentorship and proctorship with him. And what he says here is that mouth breathing eventually progresses to noisy breathing, which eventually progresses to snoring. And that eventually progresses to obstructive sleep apnea. But he makes a very important point here, stating that not all mouth breathing can cause obstructive sleep apnea. But obstructive sleep apnea always starts with snoring. That always starts with noisy breathing. And that always starts with mouth breathing. So what I'm saying here is that why can't we jump in early at mouth breathing and intervene at that stage with smaller measures rather than going more uh, intensive or extensive in an approach and make the child suffer till he reaches an obstructive sleep apnea. So what is actually the prevalence of these sleep disorders in kids? So it was found that OSA was only 1-2% to 2 in kids. Snoring was found to be 36 to 7.7%. Habitual mouth breathing was found to be 25%. Now, what this study found that the forms of pediatric sleep disordered breathing, the ones without oxygen desaturation, that is your mouth breathing, noisy breathing, snoring, or even a UARS are more common in children. And the symptoms of these are dynamic and we need to intervene early. 
So what is causing the sleep disorder breathing? Most commonly, we would have heard that it's tonsils and adenoids. But remember that tonsils and adenoids are just tip of the iceberg. But what's really deep in here is causing the fire. What are the various risk factors? So it could be adenoids, turbinates, septum defects. It could be tonsils. There could be high arched palates, which is causing a reduced nasal cavity space. Remember I said this, there is the palate goes deeper, which reduces the nasal cavity space. Then there's mouth breathing, which is changing the profile and the craniofacial growth, retruded jaws, tongue position, which is low lying position, or is it resting high up? Even the posture, like a forward neck posture, so, and the muscle tone, so not only of the tongue, but the orofacial muscle tone. These are all risk factors or phenotypes of pediatric sleep disorder breathing. Now, what Dr. Gimino found that in pediatric OSA, specifically in the non-obese kids, it was most commonly a disorder of the orofacial growth. So here we are as pediatric dentists with where we are going to play a really important role because orofacial growth is thought to be one of the prime factors as a risk factor for pediatric sleep disorder breathing. Now, what are the potential consequences of untreated pediatric sleep disorder breathing? Like what if we let go it, but we may surpass that age where the child may have certain behavior and learning issues. The child may be a moody child. They may be inattentive. They may have attention concentration spans. They may mimic ADHD like symptoms. Uh, they may have poor cognitive dysfunction, poor academic performance. Uh, even in the night, as the child is not going into deep sleep, this is going to activate your sympathetic system. That's your fight and flight response. So what happens during this is you end up bedwetting. So the the child is going to uh, bed wet. Uh, even the growth hormone release, which happens during deep sleep, is affected. So these children are having delayed growth or they may have stunted growth. Even the resistance to insulin is affected. And these kids are also prone to a lot of childhood obesity, which is most commonly seen nowadays. And nonetheless, these kids later in their age are going to be affected by a lot of cardiovascular diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, and other heart and lung problems as well. So what is so much in this shape that we are dealing with? So when there is a pronounced malocclusion, we are going to have a problem with the airway as we saw that the airways are becoming narrow. Definitely, we are going to have issues with eating, speech, and aesthetics. Now, when the airways are narrower, we are going to activate this circle or the spectrum of sleep disordered breathing. Now, as we saw that when there is sleep disordered breathing, uh, we are going to have a problem with our concentration and attention. And it's going to activate signs and symptoms like ADHD. As we also saw that the growth hormone release is affected. So not only is your general growth affected, but it also affects your facial growth like mouth breathing can cause the downward and backward growth pattern. Also, there is a high risk towards getting tonsils and adenoids and frequent allergies. Now, why does this happen? So when you're mouth breathing, you're going to exhale out a lot of carbon dioxide. Also, you're not producing enough nitric oxide. And both these are really key or detrimental to the fighting of bacteria and viruses which enter our body. So we are going to be more prone to these tonsils than adenoids. Even when we don't go into deep sleep, a lot of immune factors are also affected. And this is going to result in a lot of allergies. Another thing which is very commonly noted as pediatric dentists to us is clenching. Now, clenching is also one of the signs which could tell us that there could be a sign of pediatric sleep disordered breathing. So when we are actually struggling to breathe, when we are asleep, you're going to get your lower jaw forward. And in this unstable position, when you get your lower jaw forward, you're going to start clenching your teeth. Now, as we saw that the facial growth pattern is going to get affected, we are also going to affect the soft tissue dysfunction because of it. Now, this will further result in a malocclusion. So where are we? We started with the malocclusion. 
we ended with a malocclusion and we are resulting in a vicious circle of problems over here. Now, this is a very interesting research by Dr. Glimino. Now, what he says here is that uh, they studied a lot of monkeys. Now, these monkeys, they caused a nasal obstruction or induced a nasal obstruction to them. They went through a lot of uh, orthodontic literature. And what they also did was studied a couple of children who had OSA and they performed an adenotonsillectomy in them. But towards the end, they realized that there is a strong association of pediatric sleep disordered breathing with the orofacial muscle tone and the growth of our nasomaxillary complex. So again, we are going to play a very important role here by altering this growth pattern and which is going to help these kids overcome the obstructive sleep apnea. Now, we've also known since a couple of years, say from 1868, that adenoid facies is present. We've always studied this in our pediatric curriculum. So what are these adenoid facies? It is this mouth breathing which has altered the facial growth and that is being demonstrated as adenoid facies. Now, these craniofacial growth patterns which have changed, they're going to obviously predispose the child to SDB. And what this mouth breathing... Uh, so I'm going to start, restart from here. Uh, yes. So this was a very interesting research by Dr. Gimeno. Now, uh, what they did was uh, they studied a couple of monkeys and uh, these monkeys were induced with nasal obstruction. They also went on to understand a lot of orthodontic literature and they also studied a couple of children uh, who had obstructive sleep apnea and they were treated with adenoid and tonsillectomy. Now, what they realized is that there was a very strong association of SDB with the uh, orofacial muscle tone as well as your growth of the nasomaxillary complex. So this is where we are going to play a very important role. Now, we've also known since 1868 that adenoid facies are present. Now, through our entire curriculum or pediatric curriculum, we've known that mouth breathing results in adenoid facies. So what are these facies? You know, they are causing a change in the craniofacial growth. And when there is a change in craniofacial growth, we are putting a high risk or predisposing the risk towards SDB. Now, when there is mouth breathing happening, not only is there is a change in the craniofacial growth, but there is also an alteration of the muscles of your upper airway as well as of the face. Now, this was also studied in a few researches where the monkeys were induced with nasal obstruction. And they actually conducted these uh, studies by uh, measuring the EMG activity of the muscles. And they realized that there was an absolutely abnormal muscle tone present when there was a mouth breathing present. What they concluded here was uh, that mouth breathing, whenever there is a mouth breathing present, there will be an abnormal facial tone. Whenever there is a mouth breathing present, there will be an obstructed nasopharyngeal airway. They also found that there would be some kind of disturbance in the interplay between the muscle tone, the breathing root, as well as the structural growth of the upper airway. Now, what this study also found was that a lot of physiological functions that we perform like suction, mastication, swallowing, nasal breathing, all these right from infancy are going to play a very important role for stimulating the subsequent growth. Now, this is the reason why our children have to learn to use their muscles correctly in order to perform these functions correctly and in order to have the right growth pattern. This was another very interesting research. And what did this in interesting research state that uh, when there was a decrease in length of the maxilla and mandible, when there was an increased facial height, uh, when there was a retruded jaw, when there was a forward neck posture, a smaller posterior airway space, and an inferiorly positioned hyoid bone, these are all going to have high risk factors towards an obstructive sleep apnea. This is one of the most recent researches now, what this research found was that uh, 
there was an obstra SDB of 33% found in children. And generally the kind of malocclusions that were associated with it was an overjet, open bite or a posterior cross bite. Now, how often do we actually come across these malocclusions? Pretty often, right? Have we ever gone back and screened pediatric sleep disorder breathing in these children? We, it's about time that when we start seeing malocclusions, we need to start assessing the kids in a different way. This was another very interesting research. Now, what they said was, uh, when we have a class one, class two, or a class three malocclusion, we are definitely altering the airway. That's your pharyngeal space also. Now, when we are altering this, why can't we view the entire unit or the entire somatognathic system as one unit rather than considering the airway separate, the jaws separate? This research also found that the entire growth pattern was influenced by respiratory functions. Uh, what they also found that whenever you're breathing through your mouth, you're going to lower your mandible and your tongue is going to be positioned low, like this. Now, whenever a tongue is positioned low, uh, you will be mouth breathing. You can try it on your own as well. Like if you put your tongue up on the palate, you can easily nasal breathe and you'll not be able to mouth breathe. But when your tongue is positioned low, you will be mouth breathing. Now, this was a very interesting uh, book written by Dr. Sandra Kahn. And what she states in this book is that she herself is an orthodontist. And she's given a great deal of information regarding how environmental factors have affected the growth of our jaws. Now, when it actually came to treatment of her children, she preferred doing AV orthodontics over traditional orthodontics. And she felt that traditional orthodontics was actually narrowing the airways. Now, this little picture has been adapted from her book. And it actually gives us an idea of a profile of a mouth breather or any kind of an SDB child where they will have long facies. They'll have a depressed maxilla, droopy eyes, smaller maxillas, smaller mandible, down. Okay, so what I said was that Dr. Maria also mentioned about a couple of breathing tests. Now, these are some tests which we've seen through our pediatric curriculum where we actually look at certain uh, kind of fogging of the mirror or we can ask the child to hold some water in the mouth for three minutes or you can even put a little micropod tape and see if the child is comfortable breathing through the nose. Now, what she stated that that you should at least do a minimum of two tests to be sure of it. And also this is not a guide to tell you if the child is a mouth breather or no, but this is a guide to tell you if the child is a habitual mouth breather or the child is an obstructive mouth breather. So this is gonna give us a little idea on how we can proceed ahead with the treatment. Dr. Faisal. Assalamu alaikum. Can, can you begin with Dr. Manel? Sure. Okay, welcome. Starting? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Prof. Mohammed, for uh, this introduc introduction, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shah, for your uh, very informative lecture. Uh, I want to extend my uh, thanks to uh, the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry for having me with such great uh, speakers. Uh, and uh, now allow me to introduce the, our second distinguished speaker, Dr. Manal Halabi. Dr. Manal obtained her dental degree from the University of uh, Jordan in Amman and uh, her certificate of specialty <coughs> training in pediatric dentistry from uh, and master of oral biology from University of Maryland. Uh, at Baltimore in uh, USA. She is certified by the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry, and she is currently an associate professor and chair of the Pediatric Dentistry Department in Hamdan bin Muhammad College of Dental Medicine in uh, Muhammad bin Rashid University of Dental of, uh, Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, she is also a founding executive uh, board member of the Emirates uh, Pediatric Dentistry Club uh, of the uh, uh, um, uh, the Emirates uh, 
Dental Society. Dr. Manal is an appointed member of the Educational Committee uh, of the International Association of Pediatric Dentistry, as well as Standardized Records Committee of the International Association of Dental Traumatology. Her experience include academic positions with Boston University and University of Maryland, as well as private clinical practice. Her research interests include oral health of patients with special needs, trauma, and dental education, and biological care management in primary teeth. Dr. Manal has a numerous publication in this field, and please welcome with me Dr. Manal. Uh, she will uh, uh, present today her lecture entitled An Overview of the Updated in, uh, International Association of Dental Traumatology uh, Guideline for the Management of Traumatic Dental Injury in the Primary Dentition 2020. Please welcome with me, even virtually, Dr. Manal. Welcome, Dr. Manal. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Faisal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum I uh, really appreciate this very kind introduction. Thank you very much. And I, it's, it's my honor and uh, pleasure to be here, uh, invited by uh, the Saudi uh, Society of Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, well, I really appreciate this invitation and uh, I was enjoying uh, listening to Dr. Shah, so I hope inshallah she'll be able to come back and finish her uh, presentation. Hopefully, inshallah. Uh, inshallah. So uh, I will start, uh, inshallah. Uh, Please. Uh, so one second. Let me just go. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, so the slides are clear, right? Yeah, please. Start yes. with clear, yeah. Okay, so um, as Dr. Faisal uh, said, um, you know, I, want, I thought of uh, what to present today. And uh, this, this topic came to my mind because uh, just recently, back in May, the International Association of Dental Traumatology issued their uh, updated guidelines for uh, management of traumatic dental injuries. They actually, as they always do, they issue guidelines for management in primary and permanent dentition. And I thought it would be too much to do both. And of course, as a pediatric dentist, my, uh, uh, my affinity always is to talk about younger children. Uh, so I will try, I'll try my best to uh, present uh, these uh, guidelines to you. Um, I will I try also my best to highlight the important changes in these guidelines uh, as, um, you know, it's, it's very, very interesting actually to go these, uh, through these guidelines because uh, of course, as you know, they're all updates are always very necessary because we need to keep up uh, and, be, uh, and the guidelines need to reflect the current uh, evidence. And I think uh, one of the most important changes in these guidelines is that emphasis is put on the well-being of the child. You know, um, regardless of uh, what, what was thought before, a child comes first in these guidelines. Uh, and of course, there's a very, very uh, big emphasis here on the importance of care by a child-centered uh, uh, provider. The, you know, these such as pediatric dentists, you know, they know exactly how to manage children that prevents future anxiety, and they also know how to, uh, to manage teeth. So, and that also provides better outcome. Uh, so it's really good for us as pediatric dentists to establish a network, uh, you know, establish communication with our colleagues, the general dental practitioners, so that they know when and how to refer, we can also, uh, you know, provide advice uh, for them. And it is, it's very, very much emphasized in these guidelines, uh, pain management and, you know, both during the treatment and at home, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, and, uh, well, there are other many emphasis, they emphasize about the importance of physical appearance for children although you think you are dealing with a two-year-old or a three-year-old, but you know, research has shown that physical appearance and aesthetics are important for these children. Life, you know, war, the world is changing right now, so we really have to keep up with that. 
and uh, try to preserve the teeth as much as possible. I think this is the message that is sent by these guidelines, even for a short time. Uh, children are very resilient, and uh, you know the uh, their, uh, uh, the healing capacity is remarkable. So try to capitalize on that. Uh, with that introduction, I mean, I would like to start my presentation, and uh, the outline of the presentation would be first, uh, you know, the uh, of course I'll do some introduction in, in general about traumatic dental injuries, general management or general guide, uh, guidelines, general changes in the guidelines, prognosis and poor outcome set. Those are, you know, the new, new the, I'll talk about it when we come to it the, the, for the poor outcome set. And of course, no presentation about traumatic dental injuries is complete without all these tables and guidelines. So um, I'll go over that in a brief, uh, you know, a brief overview. Uh, for the introduction, First, you know, a quick uh, uh, introduction. Injuries, of course, uh, to the children are a major threat to their health, and usually they are a neglected public health problem. Uh, for children aged zero to six uh, years, oral injuries account for 18% of all their injuries, uh, or the physical injuries, and the mouth is the second most common area to be injured. And um, a recent meta-analysis actually of traumatic dental injuries had revealed that there's a ward prevalence of 22.7% uh, affecting the primary teeth. So, I mean, every one in four, almost one in four children uh, encounters uh, dental trauma during their uh, early childhood. So that's significant. And of course, older adults also suffer from trauma, but not in, a, you know, in the same uh, severity or manner. Now, uh, etiology, as we all know, unintentional falls, collisions, leisure activities, sports, children just try, uh, or babies trying to learn how to crawl, uh, you know, walk, run. And then, you know, the most common age of occurrence of dental injuries uh, uh, in, in primary dentition is between two to six years. And usually, uh, uh, injuries to the periodontal uh, uh, tissue are more common than uh, injuries to the tooth structure or fractures. So in, in permanent dentition, it's the other way around. You see more crown, crown fractures uh, than um, you know, periodontal injuries, such as luxations, uh, which is not the case in primary teeth. Uh, children can present anywhere with their injuries. Remember, those are very, very young children. Many of them have not established a dental home yet. So they can actually show up to a uh, hospital, a general dental practitioner. They can even go to a pharmacist seeking help, uh, help or uh, anywhere else. So uh, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, establishing a nice network is very, uh, very helpful. Uh, now, uh, for the general management of uh, the, uh, the patients or the general, because I think this is the most important part of the presentation, to, if, if you want to ask me, because this just encompasses many of the changes and how how it, how important it is to manage uh, these children. So, first of all, you know, initial presentation, as anyone who has dealt with trauma in uh, uh, young children knows that very well. Minimizing anxiety and to the child and sometimes more to the parent is very, very important. You know, everyone is distressed usually, the child, the parent, and all the dental team. So we really need to, uh, to learn how to deal with that. And this actually, as I said before, might be the reason for the child's first visit to us. So, uh, uh, you know, just be calm. And um, pediatric dentists are experts at doing knee-to-knee -knee examinations. And this, this actually can be the best uh, examination done for these very young children. So uh, always think you need need to need exam when you have a, a very young children who is pre-cooperative. Uh, a structured approach is very important when it comes to traumatic dental injuries, and it has actually been proven that a structured appro ap approach provides significant improvement in the quality of the outcome. You would, have, you would have better outcome if you have a structured approach. 
uh, history taking, uh, organized clinical exam, tests, test results collected, extra and intraoral photographs are very important. They are a great record. And uh, please make sure as much as possible to, uh, to document uh, traumatic dental injuries. There are many um, helpful forms uh, to follow a structured approach, a trauma stamp. This, this, is, this example here is uh, the one example from the uh, uh, American Ac uh, Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the reference uh, manual. And uh, it's a nice uh, reference actually. It's available for download uh, if anyone is interested. Uh, initial assessment uh, is very important. Of course, you need to know you need to have a care, uh, uh, elicit a careful medical, social, dental, and accident history, thorough examination of the head and neck. Uh, of course, that's before the intraoral and intraoral exam is very important, both soft tissue and hard tissue, and always be alert of any, any concomitant injury, to the head uh, or the facial structures, and always think of where the missing tooth fragment is. If there is a missing tooth fragment, always think where it is. It could be lodged in any laceration in the soft tissue. It could be inhaled or swallowed. Uh, so please be, you know, ask about that. If you think that medical help is needed, and that's a priority usually in patient care, seek medical help uh, immediately or ask for medical consultation. Um, soft tissue injuries are actually uh, important when it comes to traumatic dental injuries. Uh, that's why extra and intraoral exam, uh, uh, extra, extra and intraoral exams are very important. Uh, the lip, the oral mucosa attached in free gingiva and frenula are common, as you can see in this example here with the lip injury. Uh, also, if there is a missing tooth structure, structure examine uh, the the lips for possible in, uh, embedded uh, fragment in that uh, lip injury. Um, usually, I don't know if you know you've witnessed that, but usually the lip, the soft tissue injuries is what brings the child more. If the if the tooth is not broken, if it's only a, a luxation periodontal injury, parents usually the, they don't notice that. They actually notice if there is a cut, and that's why they bring the child over. For soft tissue injuries, they're more common for children between uh, younger than three, zero to three, and I always, as I have said in the beginning of my lecture, uh, management by a child-oriented team with experience in pediatric oral injuries is very important. Um, there is big emphasis. There is um, uh, big emphasis in these guidelines on parental engagement with home care uh, because home care affects prognosis. So and home, um, home care for specifically for soft tissue injuries is very important. Uh, of, to, to influence the outcome. So always remember to give uh, uh, post-visit post, post instructions or home instructions for these uh, cases. Uh, tests that we perform, uh, we do extra-oral and intra-oral photographs, as I have said before. Pulp sensibility, please keep in mind that pulp sensibility tests are unreliable in primary teeth, and therefore, the IAT does not recommend pulp sensibility tests in primary teeth, so don't waste your time doing these. Tooth mobility is important, so record tooth mobility, tooth color, tenderness to pressure or percussion, and record the position uh, or the displacement of uh, the teeth. Uh, the color of injured and uninjured teeth should be recorded, and as I said, photographs are very important, but this coloration should be recorded. Now, discoloration is an important um, outcome of, uh, pr of primary teeth injury, and it's a common com a complication usually following uh, uh, periodontal injuries or luxation injuries. Actually, almost 90% of these discolored teeth uh, fade or uh, uh, regain their original shape. Sometimes they gain a little bit original shape with some yellowish, uh, uh, you know, tint with uh, time because these things sometimes undergo obliteration of the pulpal uh, spaces. Uh, but most of the most of them actually regain their color. Uh, please keep in mind, and it takes time. It might take months. 
Uh, so, you know, inform the parents about that. And please keep in mind that persistent dark discoloration may remain asymptomatic uh, clinically and radiographically. It could be normal. So don't, you know, proceed with any root canal treatment or any pulpotomy, pulpectomy for these teeth if, they dis if they're discolored. Only do root canal treatment if these teeth are, have, show a, a clinical uh, or radiographic signs of infection. Otherwise, let it go. Inform the parents and let it go. Radiographs, uh, we really have to be very careful with radiographs and there is, you know, there is a very, very high emphasis in these guidelines on uh, limiting radiographs for primary teeth trauma. Uh, as uh, you, know, uh, you know, that there are many risks uh, associated with radiation in children. They have longer life expectancy. Uh, there's acute radiosensitivity of some developing organs and tissues. And every, any radiograph you want to expose, always question yourself. Is this radiograph, uh, will this radiograph positively affect my diagnosis or treatment provided? If not, then don't take it, okay? Just because, because you know, it's, if it's not gonna change the treatment, if it's not gonna change the diagnosis, then it's, you don't really have to, to, to do it. Um, I mean, uh, just follow the ALARA rule, in, uh, uh, which is as low as reasonably achievable radiographs in this situation. And please remember that the use of CBCT following TDIs in primary teeth is rarely indicated. So unless there is uh, severe trauma or other structures involved, do not consider any CBCTs. Uh, to, to put it together, when we want to diagnose uh, traumatic dental injuries, we need a systematic approach. It's like putting pieces of puzzle together. We need to identify all injuries because sometimes we, you know, there, there are concomitant, concomitant injuries. So uh, put it all together, include the examination of the heart tissues, such as fractures, periodontal injuries, such as vexations. Look at adjacent teeth because sometimes, you know, What's apparent is apparent, but there are other tissues, other, other teeth that are involved. So just look at, at, at the whole picture, please. And as I said, concomitant injuries in the primary dentition uh, following extrusion and lateral luxation injuries have a detrimental impact on pulp survival. It has been shown actually that the pulp survival is severely impacted when we have extrusion and lateral luxation in primary teeth. So. Uh, when you have these two injuries, think of the pulpal health. It might, you know, and, and consider, you know, uh, follow up for the need of uh, uh, root canal treatment. Um, of course, when it comes to trauma, when it comes to treatment of pediatric patients in, in general, it's very important to pay attention to any unintentional uh, or non accident, uh, intentional, sorry, or non accidental injury. Uh, and uh, dental and facial trauma uh, are common sites for uh, uh, non-accidental injuries. Uh, always check the history. Make sure the history and the uh, injuries match. Sometimes uh, delay in seeking treatment is one indication of uh, intentional uh, uh, injuries. So please be aware of that. Always, if you are suspicious, prompt referral for a physical exam for, for any you know further investigations and always be aware of your local protocols for you know child maltreatment mal and what to do in, in these cases. Now uh, of course there are many impacts of uh, orofacial and primary tooth trauma on permanent dentition. As you know there is close patient relationship between the apex of the primary tooth root and the underlying permanent uh, tooth germ. And usually, also, you know, evidence has shown that the two most, com more, you know, most uh, common injuries to cause uh, 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 sequela and permanent teeth are intrusion and avulsion. So when it comes to an intruded tooth or an avulsed tooth, usually uh, there is a much higher chance, sometimes it's up to 50% actually, of of issues in the uh, permanent teeth, and these these can you know vary from just uh, you know a white uh, patch of the permanent teeth, uh, decalcification, 
uh, to uh, hypoplasia, uh, to um, malformation, impaction, eruption disturbances, uh, and, and other uh, development, uh, other uh, uh, maldevelopments. Uh, now, this is this is might be surprising actually to some. Um, now, when it comes to intrusive and lateral luxations, I mean, if you remember in the old guidelines, uh, previous guidelines recommended immediate extraction if the direction of displacement of the root is toward the permanent tooth germ. Yeah, I mean, we, need, we used to take an x-ray and see where the apex is. If the tooth is foreshortened, that means it's, it moved you know, away. And if it's uh, uh, elongated, then that means it moved towards the uh, tooth germ. And we used to ex extract these teeth. Now, this action is no longer advised. We don't extract teeth anymore if there is intrusion or lateral luxation. Now, why is the change in that? There are many reasons, actually. First, the evidence of, there is evidence of spontaneous re-eruption for in, intruded primary teeth, and has, this has been demonstrated. Uh, the, actually, the concern that further damage may be inflicted on the tooth germ during extraction, because you know, extraction itself, if the tooth germ or the root is, is pushed towards the, the, the tooth germ, might actually cause damage. And there is lack of evidence that immediate extraction will minimize further damage to the permanent tooth germ. So what happened has happened basically, you know, it's uh, a wait and see approach is, a, is an approach that these guidelines are uh, advocating. Um, you know, you remember these pictures and, you know, extract and all that. This is not recommended anymore. Now, um, in general, the management strategy is, uh, there is limited evidence. You know, unfortunately, there's more evidence to, uh, although not much, but there is more evidence to support many treatments in permanent uh, tooth trauma. Not much evidence in primary tooth trauma. So re always remember that. And observation is our best, um, you know, best tool in this situation. And uh, especially when it comes to the emergency situation, okay? Even if you need to do further treatment, try not to do much during the emergency phase because this, you know, try to stabilize things and then do the definitive treatment later on. Uh, only interfere, uh, in the emergency situation, if there's a risk of aspiration, ingestion, or if there is interference with occlusion, okay? And uh, the conservative approach may actually reduce uh, additional suffering for children and further damage to the permanent teeth. So remember that, please, okay? And uh, this is just a summary of, uh, you know, how primary teeth should, TDI should be managed. Uh, first of all, consider the child's maturity and ability to cope. Your treatment should be tailor-made to how much the child can take, all right? And also always consider the time of shedding of the injured teeth. I mean, if there's not if a child who's five with a traumatic dental injuries of the uh, upper incisors should be treated different than a child who's two years old. And of course, man, you know, always consider the occlusion, uh, in terms of management of acute symptoms, it is critical that parents are given appropriate advice. Please, please, please do not let the parents go without giving them appropriate advice about home care so that they won't be further, there won't be any further distress to the parents. Luxation injuries such as intrusion and lateral luxation and root fractures may actually cause severe pain. So even if you're not going to do anything, and it is recommended to not to do much in the first visit, but make sure at least you, you, you recommend analgesics, such as ibuprofen or acetaminophen, paracetamol, to recommend uh, to, to, uh, to reduce the pain. So always remember that before you dismiss the patient. And uh, anxiety uh, is, is, is a big issue when it comes to management of traumatic dental injuries. Uh, of course, minimizing uh, dental anxiety is essential, uh, and our treatment depends on the maturity and the ability to cope. 
There are various behavior management approaches, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches that are available for us as pediatric dentists. And um, always remember that TDI treatment, they have the potential to lead to uh, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder and long-term dental anxiety. So be, be aware of that. And uh, uh, wherever possible, avoid extractions because uh, especially at the emergency phase. So uh, extractions are one of the most traumatic things we can do for uh, children. So uh, uh, also whenever appropriate, uh, prior prior prioritize maintaining the child's primary dentition. This is one of the things that these guidelines are really, they really emphasize upon. Maintain primary dentition as much as possible. Discuss treatment, you know, involve the parents in the decision, give them options, uh, give them uh, information about the further treatment needed, the visits, uh, um, possible impact on permanent dentition. And if uh, a pers the person is uh, a person who does not have experience with dealing with children, or if they actually do not have experience with dealing with traumatic dental injuries in primary dentition, please refer very quickly to someone who is. And you will see more recommendations for splinting in these guidelines. And it's usually um, actually, and I'll, I'll go over that, but it's recommended for alveolar bone fracture, as well as root fractures and lateral luxations. So splinting for four, for four weeks, actually. So uh, that's, that's the new thing in these guidelines. Now, uh, no change here. Avulsed primary teeth should not be reimplanted. Okay, so uh, uh, because of uh, the, the rationale behind that, the significant treatment burden for a young child, replantation, splinting, placement and removal, root canal treatment, and there is a potential of causing further damage to the permanent tooth or the eruption. But the most important reason actually why these guidelines did not recommend uh, reimplantation re of avulsed primary teeth is to avoid medical emergencies resulting from aspiration of the tooth. So be aware of that, okay? Uh, antibiotics, in terms of antibiotics, there is no evidence to recommend antibiotics for any periodontal injuries, for luxation injuries. As, uh, and then if there are any soft tissue injuries or surgical intervention needed, needed then discretion of the clinician is, uh, uh, it's left up to the discretion of the clinician. And of course, if the child has any medical, uh, underlying medical condition, any immunocompromised status, then that, that's when you either recommend antibiotics or consult with the pediatrician to do that. Of course, tetanus booster or uh, up, updated tetanus immunization should be uh, confirmed. And if there is any doubt, refer to the pediatrician within 48 hours. Uh, again, as I said before, emphasis of the, in these guidelines on parental instructions for home care because successful healing uh, following the injury is really dependent on good oral hygiene. It's recommended uh, to, you know, for the parents to clean the affected area with a soft brush or cotton swab and use alcohol-free chlorhexidine gluconate, 0.12%. Uh, Actually, in some areas of the guidelines, you will see 1, 0.1 to 0.2%. So it, I, it really depends on where you are and what the concentration available is. This, the 0.12% is the concentration available in the U.S. And uh, this should be applied topically twice a day for one week to prevent accumulation of plaque and debris and reduce bacterial load. If the child is too young and they, of course, they're younger than six, they can swish. So uh, just apply it with, make sure you apply it with a cotton swab. And uh, to follow up with home care uh, and to make sure the healing is optimal, you, you really need to inform uh, parents about prevention of further injuries. They need, children need to calm down a little bit. Uh, not, not much, you know, uh, potential hazards, hazardous activities, contact sports and all these things. 
course, care should be uh, taken during eating. Maybe a soft diet for a couple of days should be uh, uh, recommended uh, so, because we don't need further trauma uh, to, to these teeth. There's a balance actually. You don't want further trauma, but you also want to encourage, encourage normal function as soon as possible. So make sure you, you inform that uh, to the parents and uh, also advise the parents about possible complications, including swelling in the gingiva, uh, increased mobility or sinus tract, because that could happen without pain. So the parents need to keep an eye on that. Uh, always document that the parents have been informed about possible complications to the development of permanent dentition, especially following, as I said, intrusion, avulsion, and alveolar fractures, because this is where you might get uh, problems with the permanent uh, dentition. Inform the parents and document that you have informed them. This is very important. And we move now to the prognosis and the newly uh, developed core outcome set. Uh, prognosis is uh, dependent on many factors that are related to the injury, to the treatment, and uh, you know the pulp uh, and periodontal uh, outcomes can be uh, affected. Everything should be recorded for better prognosis. As I said before, the, uh, there has to be a record of the uh, uh, all all these factors. A structured history, a structured approach will provide better prognosis. Uh, if you have access to the Dental Trauma Guide uh, .org online, they actually have very very nice. Uh, uh, prognostic uh, information about injuries that you can tell you know they're important they're useful to us and they are also useful to the parents uh, they it used to be free but recently i think it's they have charged started charging a fee a nominal fee actually but they, you know it's a very nice uh, website to, to have access to now we'll talk about a little bit about the core outcome set now, this is when you read the guidelines, this is a new concept you will see in the guidelines. And this is uh, something that the IADT developed. And this is one of the uh, first core outcome set developed in dentistry. And they, they are divided into two kinds, actually. Uh, they could be generic, which might apply to all TDIs or most of the traumatic injuries. And they could be injury specific, uh, outcomes uh, and the, these are related to one or more of the uh, uh, of the traumatic dental injuries. And some examples of the generic outcomes. These generic outcomes are for you know that lump together uh, enamel fracture, heart tissue fractures, enamel fracture, enamel dentin fracture, complicated crown fracture, crown root fracture, and root fracture. And you just you have you know all possible complications or outcomes of uh, periodontal healing, including bone loss, uh, gingival recession, mobility, ankylosis, resorption. You might have complication with pulpal healing, including infection, pain, discoloration, tooth loss, quality of life uh, being affected. These are work, school, sports, aesthetics uh, from a patient perspective trauma-related dental anxiety, number of visits back to the clinic, and impact on the developing permanent condition. So those are the generic outcomes. And uh, some of the specific outcomes for, uh, for this you know, group of injuries would be the quality of restorations. It, the, related to the quality of restoration would be the loss of restoration, which is, as you know, detrimental in, in the prognosis of these, uh, of these injuries. Now, when it comes to root fracture, one of the specific outcomes is realignment. Uh, when we leave the tooth to spontaneously reposition itself after root fracture, uh, a specific injury, uh, a specific outcome is realignment. Generic outcomes the, after luxation injuries are very similar. Actually, these outcomes are very similar to the generic outcomes that I have just explained for the uh, heart tissue injuries. And some specific uh, injuries uh, outcomes for extrusion and lateral luxation will be uh, also spontaneous repositioning undertaken. Some um, specific uh, injury uh, to intrusion, uh, outcome to intrusion would be 
spontaneous repositioning of uh, the druidic tooth and infra occlusion is one another uh, outcome uh, core outcome now for avulsion uh, those are the uh, outcomes either tooth loss aesthetics quality of life dental anxiety clinical number of visits and impact on the developing permanent successor now um we're gonna i'm gonna go over the guidelines very quickly i'm, I'm not uh, you know i'm not gonna go in details because you know these these guidelines are available for all of us and we can refer to them but i'll just outline some you know some important uh, aspects of each injury so uh, the first injury would be enamel fracture the simplest one uh, which uh, which is you know involving enamel only note here that there are no radiographs recommended and you only smooth the sharp edges don't forget parent and uh, patient uh, introduction in terms of follow up no follow up needed but you know keep in mind the unfavorable outcomes that can happen and this you know these outcomes keep repeated over and over in the guidelines. Now, when it comes to enamel and dentine fracture, uh, we have uh, again here, uh, baseline radiographs are optional, but you know, all, only take radiographs at, uh, for uh, the soft tissue if there are uh, movement of, uh, if there is a missing fragment. So if you have a missing fragment, uh, it, uh, take it take a radiograph for the soft tissue because it might be embedded of course that's if the soft tissue has injury if the soft tissue does not have injury it doesn't it, then the fragment is somewhere else uh, treatment and I apologize I think these boxes uh, have uh, changed in the formatting uh, or when I shared the slides but they were they were actually meant to be around the important part but uh, I'll tell you what the important part is. Uh, cover all exposed dentine with glass enamel or uh, composite uh, restorations. Give, give uh, follow-up, uh, uh, you know, as re recommended. Give education. Now I'll give you one clinical hint, actually. Only this one. Uh, what I have, what works for me and our team at, uh, you know, in our clinic, Sometimes for very, very young children, if that's actually a, a trauma in a, as you see with, with some caries here, but a trauma in a one and a half year old. And what we did actually, we did a celluloid GIC crown. No preparation of it, it's like a whole crown. You know, we couldn't, of course, there's nothing you can do, almost nothing you can do. That's a knee to knee uh, procedure. You just uh, fill out a celluloid crown with GIC, you apply it, and then you cure it. If it's slight cured, you let the child sit in the waiting room. This was dual cured for 15 minutes, then you bring them back, you remove the celluloid crown, and you have at least done something, which, I mean, versus taking this child to, uh, for treatment under general anesthesia. In any case, this is just one example of what uh, what can be done. I mean, this this, this child obviously has more issues uh, to be dealt with, but this was the emergency uh, visit that uh, we we took care of. Now, going back to guidelines, complicated crown fractures uh, always in complicated crown fractures you have pulpal exposure, apparent pulpal exposure. And actually, I found it interesting here, but they actually, they recommend preservation of the pulp by partial pulpotomy. I think this is the first time, uh, one of the first times that I've seen a recommendation of a partial pulpotomy in a primary tooth. So keep that in mind. And uh, case selection is very important, material used. And of course, again, the treatment depends on the child's maturity. So you know uh, because and of course the available uh, uh, modalities for behavior guidance uh, to you uh, examination after clinical examination after one week six to eight weeks one year and then if you do a pulpotomy and because as you know with the guidelines of radiographic guidelines pulpotomies need, they need to be followed up by radiographs every year so if there is a pulpotomy then do a radiograph after a year now, when it comes to crown root fractures, 
it really depends if this uh, you know usually you have a fragment uh, that is uh, you know uh, of the, the crowd and the root that is fractured now the it could be that there is no uh, no pulpal exposure so uh, if there is uh, the, and it says here that no treatment may be the most appropriate treatment in the emergency situation, but uh, it really depends if how how if if the patient needs to be referred. In terms of uh, if there is a loose fragment with uh, with no uh, pulp uh, exposed, uh, then uh, just cover it with the composite or glass ionomer. If uh, the pulp is exposed. Uh, uh, do a pulpotomy and uh, then uh, depending you know on the stage of the uh, of the root development now if that root fragment if that if the tooth is unrestorable okay if the line of fracture of the uh, uh, root is very very subgingival you have two options actually the option the second option if it's unrestorable extract the loose fragment taking care not to damage the permanent successor be very gentle in your extraction and uh, leave any firm root fragments in place okay or extract the entire tooth but an option an easier option if you can't extract the entire tooth just remove the fragment and leave the uh, uh, remove the loose fragment so that's that's one option uh, when it comes to root fractures, you know, uh, it really depends on the uh, displacement. If the coronal fragment is not displaced, there is no treatment required. And uh, But if there is coronal fragment displacement, remember as what I mentioned before, that root fracture is one of the painful uh, uh, injuries. So make sure if you're doing anything to provide local anesthesia and what you can do you can either extract only the loose coronal fragment and leave the apical fragment in place, or uh, the other option, if you know, if you want to preserve the tooth, as it is the you know the trend here uh, to do tooth preservations, uh, gently reposition the loose coronal fragment, and if it's unstable, then place a splint for uh, four four months actually. And the splint has to be flexible and attach it to adjacent and injured teeth. And uh, for alveolar fractures, uh, reposition uh, the tooth under local anesthesia. This is another painful thing that you really need anesthesia for. And uh, then, I mean, I apologize about the position of, of these boxes, but it's okay. You've got the point. Uh, then, uh, stable after you reposition the tooth stabilize with a flexible splint to the adjacent uninjured teeth for four, uh, for four weeks also. So another splint use here, a, a flexible splint four weeks for uh, alveolar fractures. Concussion, no treatment, the tooth has been concussed in its place, so don't do anything. Of course, just inform the parents about complications that might happen. Subluxation, no treatment is needed but observation. Um, and then, uh, of course, parent patient, uh, patient parent education is very important. When it comes to extrusive luxation, treatment decisions are based on the degree of displacement, the mobility, and the interference with the occlusion, root formation, and the ability of the child to cope with the or to tolerate the treatment. But, um, I mean, there are two options. If the tooth is not interfering with the occlusion, uh, even if it's slightly in extruded, then let it go. It will spontaneously reposition itself. If the tooth is excessively mobile or extruded more than three millimeters, then extract under local anesthesia. So that's for extrusive luxation. Radiographic follow-up only included where clinical findings are suggestive of pathosis. Okay, now when it comes to lateral luxations, if there is minimal or no occlusal interference, the, shoe, the tooth should be left alone and allowed to spontaneously reposition. 
uh, this could take up to six months. And if there is severe displacement, there are two options. The first option is to extract when there is a risk of ingestion or aspiration, or the other option is to gently reposition the tooth. Uh, if it's not stable, then place a splint. Again, four weeks, a flexible splint, and uh, can, you know, uh, splinted to adjacent uninjured teeth. So three, either this is the third uh, situation where a splint can be used, okay? And for intrusive luxations, uh, that tooth should be allowed to spontaneously reposition itself irrespective of the direction of placement. Don't worry about the direction of displacement. Let the two, three re-erupt, okay? And this actually can take up to a year. So make sure you inform the parents so that they don't get restless after three days. Just inform them that it's going to be it's, it's going to be a while. And um, radiographic follow-up is only needed if the clinical findings are suggestive of pathosis. So only take radiographs if they're don't keep exposing radiographs unless there is a, a suspicion of uh, pathosis. Avulgence, easy, if do not replant, okay? And let it go, that's unfortunate, but that's one thing that is still, you know, should, should stay out. And this is just a summary of the splinting. I think I've repeated that many times uh, in the presentation, root fractures, splint for four uh, weeks if required, lateral luxation, splint for four weeks, flexible splint, and alveolar fracture is required and splint for four weeks. Now, this is my last slide, my summary slide, the take home message, what I would like you to leave the lecture with, uh, and I hope this was a, an informative lecture for you, uh, always consider the child first. Uh, and make sure that the care is carried out by a child-oriented provider who have experience with dealing with TDIs. Avoid treatment in emergency phase as much as possible. Just try to stabilize things. Minimize anxiety and pain. Of course, uh, this, is, you know, this is very important. And always remember that the physical appearance and aesthetics matter to the children. Uh, so, especially with the new generation, try to preserve the teeth for as long as possible. You know, even just for the length of the splint, even if the teeth are not going to stay, uh, just preserve the teeth for as long as, uh, as you can. And always also remember that there is very scar scarce evidence regarding the management of TDIs in children. And remember the resilience of our patients. They are resilient, super healing capacity, so capitalize on that. Thank you very much. This is my email if anyone, if anyone has any questions. If you'd like a copy, a PDF copy of the uh, presentation, I'll be more than happy to share it with you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Manal, uh, for your uh, nice and well-organized uh, and uh, informative uh, presentation and lecture. Uh, so uh, at the end of this lecture, we will uh, go to take some couple of questions. But before we go to that, I really uh, want to thank you about your nice trip, uh, nice tip about the, the GIC using as HAL technique. I think we can use it also with the, the small uh, child, the small kids, yes. uh, even without trauma. Thank you for this nice uh, tip. Uh, the other thing uh, I want to emphasize also about the documentation, as we know that the AABD have the, that, uh, the, the trauma um, uh, form that we can use it. It's easy and uh, organized. Uh, I, I want to emphasize on that again. Uh, the last thing, uh, Doctor, about I think uh, before we go to the questions, I think the uh, splinting of uh, luxated teeth, this is a new um, guideline. It was not in the guidelines before. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you think, or do you think that four weeks for luxated tooth will not cause some, sometimes some ankylosis or uh, it is too, too much to use it for four weeks? Yeah, we know that we can use it for the, uh, the, the alveolar fracture or the 
root tip fracture. But for the luxated tooth, what do you think about this tip? I honestly thank you very much, uh, Dr. Faisal, for your, for your comments, actually. They're all very, very uh, uh, great comments. And uh, uh, so, I, I mean, to answer your questions, I honestly, my answer is I, I don't know. As I said, there is very, uh, I think, the, uh, the evidence to support or refute the guidelines is very, very scarce. But um, I, you know, I don't know why they recommend it for, you know, especially as you said, for luxation injuries. Is it because it needs time for the periodontal ligament uh, to heal? Maybe they, you know, they figured that for, because, you know, in, in, in terms of permanent teeth, we, and especially when it comes to uh, avulsion, you know, you don't want to splint more than two weeks because you want to encourage normal uh, movement, you know, to prevent uh, uh, replacement related uh, resorption or ankylosis of, of the teeth. Uh, and of course, this should be an issue here in terms of pr primary teeth. This is a great question that I unfortunately don't have the answer for, but uh, we'll keep digging, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yes, for sure. Yes. There is something in the trauma, especially there is uh, as a, it's a practice. Uh, we will do the, the 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 management, and we will just follow up, and we'll see what will happen. Uh, this is the exactly. what we can do about trauma. So going for the I think this uh, question, uh, we have a, uh, one for a question from uh, some of the doctors, but here uh, uh, there is a doctor. The name is not appeared. He want just a small um, our. our uh, just a little um, bit hint about the knee to knee uh, position with yes. the child. Yeah. Can you give them the hint, please? Of course, of course. Thank you very much for the question. Actually, uh, uh, we, you know, you sit uh, uh, opposite to the parent, okay, and uh, you put, you, you actually ask the parent to first put the child on their lap uh, with the child facing them as if you know they uh, you know the child is sitting on the parents uh, lap facing them with uh, usually if they're uh, old enough you know let their let their uh, uh, legs uh, wrap around the parent and then ask you know ask the parent to lower the child's uh, head and back and put their head and back on your on your lap actually this way you have control you know and and sometimes it's helpful if you know you have one of your your left hand if you're right-handed wrap your left hand gently around you know the head and 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 the shoulders just to stabilize the child while you do your examination but this is a wonderful uh, method of examining the the young, you know the younger children so uh, thank you for the question thank you uh, there is a, a question about the antibiotic that since you said that the analgesics is only enough they are asking is uh, uh, are you recommended to use antibiotic uh, with the trauma, uh, either if there is soft tissue or without soft tissue injuries? Yeah, well, the guidelines, they say, actually, this is also for permanent uh, teeth trauma, not just primary. Uh, if there is no soft tissue injury, if it's only, uh, you know, a uh, periodontal ligament uh, injury or hard tissue tooth injury, no need to use antibiotics. If it's a soft tissue, use your discretion depending on the severity or if you have any surgical intervention. But it's not recommended to use any antibiotics in, in normal situations. And about the x-rays also for the soft tissue, you just uh, uh, explained before, they are asking about the dose. I think yes, the yeah. that's a great question actually. It should be 20% of, uh, of the normal dose of heart tissue for the teeth. So whatever dose you use depending on your machine, uh, and on your film, whatever you use to take x-rays for your uh, teeth, 20% of that should be used to detect uh, uh, fragments in, in soft tissue. So the last question, Doctor, about the recommendation of splinting, the type of splint and uh, uh, how many teeth you will include in your splint? Uh, another great question. Uh, it's a flexible splint. You can use a thin uh, stainless steel uh, uh, ortho wire, or you can use a fish 
act actually. Uh, the the uh, it is recommended usually to use one. Uh, do not extend it too much. Use one tooth on, on each side. So if it's only if it's a central incisor, use the lateral on one side and the central on the uh, on the other side. Thank you, Dr. Ramanal, for your very informative lecture, very informative uh, answering of the question. And on behalf of uh, the Saudi Society of uh, Pediatric Dentistry, I extend my thanks to you. And uh, hopefully we'll meet again in the next meetings, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the honor. Thank and and uh, we are sorry for keeping you late uh, in Dubai no. now. It's almost 11. <laughs> no, thank no, you, it's okay. Actually, I just, uh, sorry, I just wanted to say that we are working with the uh, International Association of Dental Dermatology to uh, translate all the new guidelines, nice. the practice and the permanent to Arabic, inshallah. So, Thank inshallah, you. we'll have Arabic soon. Inshallah. Shukran, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> now we are back uh, to Dr. Prof. Batal, Dr. Mohamed Al Batal. They are going back to Dr. Shah lecture and after that, the closure. The mic is yours, Doctor. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Faisal. Thank you, Doctor Ramanel, for the amazing lecture. Yes. I now uh, welcome again, Doctor Ankita. Hi. Yes. Audible. Uh, yes. <laughs> Can you sharing again the lecture? Uh, I think uh, if uh, any attendee cannot present from uh, beginning, the Doctor uh, Ankita is. Uh, a present topic, pediatric sleep disorder facing and tongue tie and oral my function syrup. Okay, doctor, welcome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry for the whole technical glitching. Uh, there was a little network issue. Uh, so I'm going to continue from where we left. And uh, what we actually said over here is that like uh, in children, like 60 to 70% of their growth is completed by six years and 90% of their growth gets completed by 11 to 12 years. Now, when it comes to their brain development, their entire 90% of their brain development is completed by five years. So isn't it wise enough that we intervene early? We start intervening almost after entire growth as well as the brain development is completed. So I personally believe that prevention is the key over here in treating obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, now, when we look at Dr. Gimeno's study, now what he stated was that restoration of nasal breathing during sleep as well as during wakefulness is the only fillish line for pediatric sleep disordered breathing. Now, why they said this was, uh, they studied a couple of children who had done adenoids and tonsil surgery. And what they realized is that uh, even after surgery, uh, there was a relapse of symptoms in their adulthood or even during their adolescence and full blown mm -hmm. symptoms of OSA were seen. Now, when, when they saw this, they realized that there's something going on here. Like, so even after treating adenoids and tonsils, we weren't able to achieve success. So they realized that unless and until we do not achieve nasal breathing, until and unless we do not correct the craniofacial growth and the oral muscle tone, we will not achieve success with pediatric sleep disordered breathing. So this was another very interesting research. Now what they found was there were 35 children. They were treated with adenoid tonsils. They were even treated with orthodontics. But, uh, and all were referred for oral malfunctional therapy. But only 11 of these kids completed the oral malfunctional therapy. And these 11 kids didn't have a relapse of symptoms. Their AHI was maintained at nil. But the other 13 kids who did not complete the oral malfunctional therapy, there was a relapse of symptoms that were seen. So this study clearly indicated that only orthodontics is also not going to help. So combined orthodontics and myofunctional re-education was more successful than either treatments individually. Uh, so every era is bringing a change in the thought of work and we should be extremely gratified by the fact that we as pediatric dentists are being able to work with the medical profession and we can help resolve this epidemic of pediatric sleep disorder bleeding.
and believe me there are more cases of pediatric sleep disordered breathing than corona virus right now even ada in its policies has stated that dentists are probably the first ones to identify the symptoms and we are the ones who can discuss this with the patients we are the ones who can identify the growth and development and other risk factors also for pediatric sleep disordered breathing we as dentists are also the ones who are going to fabricate the oral appliance so they always state that we should continually update our knowledge and undergo training for dental sleep medicine even fdi has stated the same in its policies that dentists should be understanding the process of screening treatment and how the whole role of multidisciplinary team occurs in pediatric sleep disordered breathing they should be undergoing treatment or a training for learning the pediatric sleep disordered breathing now what is oral myofunctional therapy we are constantly hearing the word oral myofunctional therapy now this any changes in the oral myofunction is going to have lasting changes on your facial profile and the very fact that orthodontics is required for every second child today is indicating that there is a myofunctional disorder in every second child today and as i uh, see it pictographically from this the it's the therapy that is targeted towards the muscles of the face and the tongue now it's basically a therapeutic intervention to reeducate these muscles for their function as well as at rest now is this myofunctional therapy new actually not it's right from 1918 that alfred rogers mentioned that functional or these myofunctional exercises were very important for improving the functional activity and he also stressed on the facial development rather than just mechanical orthodontia he actually also mentioned that muscle training is very important to correct mouth breathing he also stated that when we are actually correcting the jaw that is the class 2 or a class 3 we are changing the position of the jaw okay if we are changing the position of the jaw we have to reeducate the muscles to adapt to this new position so he again in 1950 presented towards the american society of orthodontics and uh, in chicago and he made a paper uh, titled a restatement of myofunctional orthodontics and he stated that it is not only an intelligent application for an orthodontist but it is absolutely beneficial for the growing child so what are the goals of myofunctional therapy it's pretty simple lips together breathe through your nose and tongue up on the palate so we are at a problem solving game now like what is preventing the child to keep the lips together what is preventing them from breathing from the nose what is preventing them to keep their tongue up on the palate so this is how we are going to come at our treatment plan now why should the tongue be resting on the palate why is it so important now as we see in this picture uh, when the tongue is resting high up on the palate we have a nice wide open airway but when the tongue is resting low this back of the tongue is going to block the airway and there's going to be some disturbance to the turbulence of air flow here so what is causing this tongue to lie low it could be tethered tissues sometimes tonsils and adenoids cause the tongue to rest low but sometimes it's the opposite that a low resting tongue posture is increasing the tonsils and adenoids when the tongue is resting high up on the palate it can cause an expansion of the jaw believe me the tongue can exert 500 grams of force whereas what is the force that we give from braces it's practically 1.3 to 1.7 grams so if it is resting high up we're going to get a nice wide u shaped arch and when an arch is wide we are having a nice wide nasal cavity but similarly if it is resting low we are going to get a v shaped arch we're going to get a deep palate and a narrow nasal cavity now we've been hearing tongue ties quite lately very commonly we are hearing tongue ties tongue ties tongue ties in a lot of things which are related to sleep disorders so tongue ties as a phenotype was recognized just 4 to 5 years ago 
Now, what I'm trying to say here is that your front of the tongue may be mobile, but what about the back of the tongue? So this research, which Dr. Kivino conducted, what he saw was that there were 130 children and these children were aged between three to 12 years. Now he divided them into two groups. So there was a group one where these children had OSA, uh, but these children didn't have tonsils and adenoids. They had a short lingual frenulum and they use a Marchison's protocol to evaluate this frenulum. There was a group two of children who were also having OSA, but they had tonsils and adenoids and they did not have a lingual frenulum. Both of these groups had OSA. So what is the study actually telling us that children with pediatric sleep apnea can present in multiple types. There may be many phenotypes to this. So we can have a high AHI even when there is a no lingual frenulum present, but we can even have a high AHI when only tonsils and adenoids are present. So what they're saying here is that uh, we need to identify these, but these short lingual frenulum cases, these are the cases where sleep apnea actually develops at a little later stage. It doesn't develop right away like in tonsils and adenoids. And these tongue tie related cases also have a lot of dysmorphosis of the jaws. You will often find a narrow upper jaw. You will often find crooked teeth. And this predisposes the SDB at a worse risk than what it would, it would be with tonsils and adenoids. Now, there are some tongue ties which are obvious and there are some tongue ties which are not so obvious. Now, we know that the tongue should be reaching up and the tongue should be mobile. But what about the back of the tongue? What about the floor of the mouth? Now, this is a not so obvious tongue tie. But if this child tries to reach this tongue tip up, he's actually going to create a lot of compensation from the floor of the mouth. This child may probably do okay with his speech, but he may have some kind of tongue thrusting or a reverse swallow. He may present with some kind of compensations from floor of mouth, which is going to cause strain in the muscles of the neck. It can even give you a forward neck posture. It can give you crooked teeth. It can also give you narrow jaws. And later in adult age, you can have neck issues, upper back pain, etc. So I want you to know over here that tongue tie is 100% one part of the puzzle of the pediatric sleep disorder breathing. It's one phenotype, but it is not the only thing that causes pediatric sleep disorder breathing. So I want you to take a step back and start evaluating from every angle. Not all tongue ties can cause pediatric sleep disordered breathing. Generally, in earlier times, uh, tongue ties were measured using the Kotlow scale, where they actually measured just the length of the frenulum. But what about the functional assessment of their tongue? Is the anatomical assessment only important? No. We just said that the back of the tongue has to raise up, so that we have a nice and wide open airway. Now, if that is the case, then what are we missing? Our diagnostic tools are not so sensitive. So this was a new scale that was developed, which is called the TRMR scale. Now what they did is they assessed the ratio of the mouth opening at rest. They assessed the ratio of that to the mouth opening when the tongue is touching at the spot that is right behind your teeth. And they assess the ratio of mouth opening when the tongue was in suction. That's like this. So what they realized from this scale is this was the grading that they gave. And once, obviously when it was below 25%, it was considered a tongue tie. But I also want you to understand that below 25% of mobility can also be because of certain kind of myofunctional dysfunctions. It can also be because of lack of tongue space also. So we need to evaluate a complete picture and not evaluate everything as a tongue tie. So is this mouth breathing, tongue ties, malfunctional stuff new? It's actually the paucity of knowledge in orthodontics and the etiology of orthodontics that is actually compelling us to attach the cause effect relationship in the other way. How nice it would be if we can go back and start understanding the cause and effect relationship in a different way. 
So what I'm trying to say here is that we've often seen proclined teeth and we often say that, okay, it must be because of a mouth breathing. It may be because of a thumb sucking or it may be because of a tongue thrusting. But did we realize that is that the primary etiologic agent or is it just a merely related symbiotic factor? Let me give you an example here. Now, if we consider this normal swallow pattern, we are going to have our teeth together, tongue resting nicely up on the palate and we continue our normal swallow. But when we are actually tongue thrusting, your tongue is going to rest low and it is going to come in between your teeth and create a pressure and then you're going to swallow. So is the tongue thrust that is causing the tongue to go low? Can we just reverse back over here and observe what is present over here? These are the tonsils which is actually causing the tongue to rest low. So the tonsils would be the primary etiologic factor and tongue thrusting would be just a merely related symbiotic factor. But don't get me wrong over here, there could be multiple reasons for a tongue to rest low. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to find out that cause and treat that cause as that is the primary etiologic factor. This is another example. Now, way back in, I would say, 1939, uh, Dr. Weston Price stated that there was a strong correlation between diets, mouth breathing, and caries. Now, as we see through this chart, we know that with the traditional diet and with the next generation modern diet, we are having longer facies, we are having narrow nostrils, we are having downward and backward growing jaws. So is mouth breathing actually the primary causative agent? No, it is actually the diet in this case, which, which would be the primary causative agent. Which way should I go? That depends on what you see. Ah, how convenient. Enter omniscient monkey right on cue. Well, you know what they say. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. That's it. No more fortune cookies for you. Hey, where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the better question is, where are you going? Oh, someplace wonderful, mister. Where, where you... You didn't happen to catch the song I sang a few minutes ago, did you? I didn't have the pleasure. To recap, I want to live in some beautiful place outside. A carefree place where I don't have to hide or worry. <laughs> a life without worry. You seek Hakuna Matata. Hakuna Tamata? Hakuna Matata. It means no worries. Perfect. Mind taking that stick of yours and drawing me a map up? Oh, hey! To find it, you must look beyond what you see. What the heck is that supposed to mean? It means look beyond what you see. Beyond what I see. <laughs> Get a lot of a monkey getting all existential on me. Beyond what I... So what this little snippet from Lion King, it's one of my favorite cartoons. And it's giving out a literally a very lovely message over here, uh, saying that we need to start looking beyond what we were actually seeing. So now I come to this interesting research over here. Now, what this research is saying that even though tonsils and adenoids were used as the first line of treatment, uh, we've already seen that we need to assess multiple things and we need to correct the craniofacial growth and we need to induce nasal breathing. But it is also very important that we assess the mouth breathing during sleep also and not only through the day. And this research actually showed us that there was, whenever there was a mouth breathing, that is a nasal disuse. And whenever there was a tongue motor immaturity, that is a poor muscle tone of the tongue, there were higher associated respiratory index. And what they also found was that when the craniofacial risk factors, that is the growth of the jaws or the shape of the jaws, had more pronounced effects of SDB in children. That's when I say that myofunctional orthodontics or AV orthodontics should be the new normal. 
So what is airway orthodontics? Now, traditionally, we know that orthodontics focused on aesthetics and straight teeth. But airway orthodontics is something that is focusing on function. So it's going to treat your causes. You're going to get better airways, more stability, better growth because you're actually changing the growth pattern. You're going to get a better function and you're going to get straight teeth as a byproduct. Let's have a look at this video as well. Problems. I had no uh, functional issues previous to orthodontics. Okay. So maybe there were some like breathing issues or maybe I used to, I never used to snore. That was another thing. I, I don't snore still till date. Right. But uh, there was no functional issues as, as such. Like now I feel with my joints clicking and popping sometimes, right? So post orthodontics, my teeth came into position, right? Like you can see my bite is compensated for, right? Uh, but what happened in bargain was like uh, my chin was pushed back and down, right? So if I leave my lips at rest, it shows a lot of my lower incisors, right? right. And that it has increased my interlabial gap significantly. I've never had any issue with closing my lips pre-orthodontics. Even with my teeth protrusion, I used to do fine because there wasn't this, like my lip, my lower lip didn't used to hang pre-orthodontics. Like post-orthodontics, this has been an issue. So I've been struggling. That's why my lower lip has become a, a lot thicker, right? Because it continuously, I continuously try to purse my lips close. So. In, and in that uh, scenario where I try to close my lips uh, forcefully because orthodontics has pushed my uh, face down and uh, back a bit, right? I'm not saying it was perfect before this, but it has done that to some extent that it's, I can notice that. So what I try to do is I try to close using my lips and I recruit a lot of other facial muscle, muscles. And uh, previous to this, I had no such uh, uh, asymmetry in my face, which is now, uh, which I can now notice. It's quite minor, but I can notice it in the photos. Like you have to be looking for it. And even then I can see like my jaw is getting canted a bit uh, on this uh, right side where I'm putting much more pressure to close my lips and obtain a natural lip seal, right? So I can feel like the right uh, joint is suffering a bit. So this has been caused because maybe like the interlabial gap has uh, been increased a lot. So mm -hmm. that's an issue I feel that orthodontic doesn't uh, orthodontics doesn't address, right? Could you that's even it. tell me about uh, what you felt as a child, like about the habits and what you said that you could relate to some signs like moodiness and all of those things as well? Yeah, like basically uh, for all my uh, school life. Like the, even if even if I uh, when I when I came to learn about uh, ortho uh, orthotropics, myofunctional therapy, and all these things, like I started noticing my childhood pictures, right? Yeah, even from the start when I was born, from the get go, I had like an always an open mouth posture. Like you couldn't be right saying like I was mouth breathing, but uh, I never felt like I had like. Uh, people, we take these things for granted because bedwetting as a child is taken for granted. Like that's what children do, right? You just have to be trained. That's what people thought. But uh, I could feel a lot of things like academically. When I was in school, I used to feel completely lost. Like I wasn't there. When I was there, I was mentally there, right? And mm -hmm. in uh, my, in, 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 back in my house, I was completely hyperactive. Mm -hmm. Like I was a ruckus. Right. Uh, even so, like late into my teens, my uh, mother had to uh, get me some sort of medications that would slow down my metabolism or mm -hmm. like make me you know, a, let, a little less active. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was the thing. Like when I was, and uh, even into my preteens, like that was the main part. Into my preteens, that was when I started noticing like I had trouble breathing. There were there were moments when I was sleeping alone and I would feel like I can't breathe, I can't get a full breath in, right? Mm. 
so maybe um, down the line i started compensating it for uh, compensating it by mouth breathing and only when my mouth open and uh, i didn't know like that was i thought that was a normal thing right mm-hmm. because you never uh, notice these kind of thing unless you are aware about the issues like mouth breathing is wrong if not told about this when mm-hmm. we are children right mm-hmm. nobody tells us about this not even your parents like it's not like they don't care they just don't know like there are issues so that's what i felt and so how, how issues, long were you like thumb sucking then thumb sucking was i said pretty long right and right? like into a 9th or 10th standard maybe 9th okay. standard Yeah, nine, seven, eight, nine standards. So pretty, pretty good, pretty good, okay. pretty late into my teens. Okay. I was, uh, I used to. Yeah. So what I was trying to say through this video is that this child is twenty-three years old, and uh, orthodontia at twenty-three years old child has caused a TMJ disorder, bedwetting in his childhood, hyperactivity. the mother had to give him medication to slow down his metabolism he used to thumb suck till the age of 14 and 15 do we think like a 14 and 15 year old would be thumb sucking because of psychological reasons or insecurity not really this child was a full blown pediatric sleep disorder breathing patient who has not corrected the growth pattern of his jaw and that's when he's facing all these troubles because of orthodontia so what orthodontics does is it moves teeth every orthodontics does is correcting the facial growth pattern active treatment in orthodontics actually starts only after all teeth have erupted and every orthodontics concentrates on correcting right from 3 to 4 years of age so that we can guide the growth so in orthodontics generally we are going to push the teeth back and we are not focusing on bringing the jaws forward Orthodontics also demands a lot of extraction of teeth. Every orthodontics completely tries to avoid extraction of teeth. If we've corrected the cause behind the crooked teeth, why would there be a relapse, right? So that's the reason orthodontics always have a fixed retainer and permanent retainers whereas every orthodontics will not have this. and every orthodontics obviously concentrates on the airway space whereas traditional orthodontics does not concentrate on it and as we already saw it is causing some kind of damage to the tmj if we are masking the skeletal growth so basically traditional orthodontics does is masking of skeletal growth and they are not looking at correcting the growth now this was an interesting study or a case study i would say where there were these two kids and they had signs of sdb where they were clenching their teeth they were mouth breathing they had high ahi they had a class 2 malocclusion and they were treated with oral malfunctional therapy and some form of prefabricated malfunctional appliances so we clearly know that correcting with malfunctional therapy and prefabricated malfunctional appliances can help us correcting sleep disordered breathing but i also want you to understand that there are some limitations also to using prefabricated appliances and we must be very case specific with it so what i'm trying to say here is that orthodontics has always asked us to wait and wait until all teeth have erupted all the growth pattern is completed the brain development is completed so dr bowman actually states that it is the responsibility of a very wise man who is actually asking someone to delay a treatment during a developing malocclusion so that's what i am saying that we have to start treating early why can't we treat when the patient is a uh, at a younger age we the mainstream medical profession is always treating when the patient is on fire when the tonsils are so big when the sleep apnea is so severe when the growth pattern is so completed why can't we intervene when there is smoke it takes a village one person cannot resolve all problems so i advise that a multidisciplinary team of approach to treat pediatric sleep disorder breathing is a must and i would say that we as pediatric dentists really play a very big role over here 
So our team takes a multidisciplinary approach where we are looking at structural correction, which involves your facial growth pattern, tonsils, tongue tie, adenoids, nasal obstructions, etc. We are also looking at functional corrections, which is your myofunctional therapy. And we are also looking at behavioral corrections, which involves your sleep patterns, that is your sleep hygiene. So this is one of our cases where this child was suffering from mouth breathing and post malfunctional therapy. We used a myobrace because that was easily available for us. And what this child actually found was that her mouth was remaining closed. The bad odor had completely gone. The cuff fold and allergies was pretty much nil. And the child used to get irritated and had difficulty in organizing tasks earlier, which was also completely resolved. This is another case that we treated using oral malfunctional therapy. We also had to do a tongue tie release for this child. This child was a class three malocclusion. And this is where what we've achieved after oral malfunctional therapy. And if we wouldn't have treated this child and waited just like orthodontia until the child had become nine, 10 and 11 years, we would have to intervene surgically for this child. That's another case where this child was nine years old. Uh, we took up this little challenge where we wanted to work on malfunctional therapy for this child and look at what we've achieved for this child in eight months. This also child had noisy breathing. Can you see uh, this child had a deviated nasal septum? Can you see a recessed maxilla here and how the maxilla has grown forward in this case? This was another child who reported to us with uh, snoring. Uh, he also felt that he was losing breath a couple of times in the night. Uh, this child had big adenoids, crooked teeth, narrow upper jaw, as well as a narrow lower jaw, as we see in these pictures. And uh, we performed malfunctional therapy. We gave him a, a couple of nasal rinses. And at the, simultaneously, we performed a tongue tie release for this child. And this was at the end of three months at how he is individually reaching up to the spot without raising the floor of the mouth. Look at that. That's how the back of the tongue is going up. And we need to hear what the child has to say over here. Hello, I am Harsh. I was operated by Dr. Ankita for tongue tie. Before that, I couldn't lift my tongue too high and not move it across the whole mouth but after I was operated my tongue felt a bit free and I was and swallowing was easy it felt like a whole stone was rolled out of there thank you what he's saying is he actually felt a lot free he could easily swallow and this is what the parent had to say after the surgery once uh, the tongue tie was released, uh, in few days time we observed that uh, uh, the pattern of the uh, sleeping posture of hers was changed. Uh, he was quite peaceful in sleep. Uh, his mouth was shut. He was taking breath from the nose. Uh, snoring was absolutely stopped. Uh, so overall he, uh, we felt that he is very comfortable in sleep. And uh, I must give credit to Dr. Ankita for that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ankita, for a timely uh, diagnosed uh, his problem and resolve it. Thank you. So what we realized is that releasing a tongue tie completely resolved the snoring. So it, I wouldn't say that we do not have to look at other things, but we worked on malfunctional therapy. We reinstilled his nasal breathing. We are working on correction of his jaws also. And we will be retaking an x-ray to assess the size of the adenoids. And then how we correct it is if there is a requirement for surgery, we will go for the adenoid surgery. But currently, the child is absolutely having a peaceful sleep. He's absolutely easily swallowing things. There is no snoring at all. So what I'm trying to say here is that our mouth is actually the window to our soul, but it is also the window to our health status. So should just do nothing, it's all impossible, or we should just do it. Nothing is impossible. 
In fact, I would say it's time for pediatric dentistry to develop a new thought process. Let's start thinking out of the box and resolve this epidemic of pediatric sleep disordered breathing. I thank you all for listening to me. And I, uh, I would really recommend we all should join hands and start growing healthier airways. We'll have much happier kids around us. Uh, these are my contact details. If you need to contact me, you can contact me on these details further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ankita, for a really amazing lecture and uh, very uh, topics uh, important for the death history. I think some of the death history uh, don't apply anything for it. And uh, thank you for a uh, very text, uh, important uh, assessment of Tang Tai by uh, Tang Tai assessment. There is only one question only for you. Uh, airway orthodontic can be uh, made for adult or uh, child only? Pardon? Airway orthodontic? Airway. No, it can be for both. For both. It can be for both. Yes. So for adults, definitely there will be some form of surgical interventions where you may need um, implant-assisted expansions and a little bit of change in jaw position might require surgery. Uh, but it's, that's the reason we say that we should intervene early where we can actually change the growth pattern of the child. Thank you. Okay, I uh, would like to thank all uh, scientific committee and all uh, board members of SSPD. And uh, also I need to thank all attendees for uh, seeing with uh, me. And uh, on behalf of SSPD, let me love to give you appreciation certificate for you, Dr. Ankita, and for then for Dr. Faisal, uh, Dr. Manel, and then Dr. Faisal. Dr. Ankita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope you are uh, meeting again in, and again in other webinar and. Uh, very conference. Dr. Definitely. Manet. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Faisal, uh, it's a of appreciation for him. Uh, and thank you for all attendees. And I see you uh, in the next webinar, I think, uh, in uh, 12. The second next webinar is uh, 15 July. Okay, uh, see you again and goodbye. Thank you all. Bye bye, Dr. Ankita. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.